more votes. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. And uh, I don't see any public here. Is there any public remotely that want to make comments? And Paxton, we'll address your issue under other business. Not hearing any, we'll move on to Trail Project's update, Spring Creek Trail, which is the trail that goes from the infamous Thunder Chicken to uh, I-49 past uh, Game and Fish. What do we got? Uh, we've been working with Game and Fish on their... <laughs> there we go. We've been working with... Uh, Game and Fish on their easement document. I think that goes to their that goes to their board or commission this week. I think tomorrow. So is that the only easement we're waiting on to go to bid? No, we're appraising uh, a couple of pieces of property on the back east of 40th oh, yeah. Street. Mrs. King and King and the Brandons. Yeah. So we're needing easements, three or four easements get those that allows us to go to bid okay very little I don't know of any um, I don't know of any utilities to amount to much uh, there will be water and maybe some sewer right where it crosses with 40th Street and that'll be part of our 40th Street project but we'll actually do it whoever gets there first. And on our trail. Gantt chart, those of you who are remote don't have this chart, but it, it's a project by project. Um, 40th or Spring Street? Spring. We're under still under design through this, nope. June of 20, uh, right away acquisition. Ah, it's magic. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at the Gantt chart, it's about uh, Spring Street is or Spring Trail is about halfway down. Um, and we're in the right-of-way acquisition phase. Uh, then we would go to utility relocation, which shouldn't take very long. So by May of next year, by according to the, our plan, is by May of next year to have that one done. That's good. Any. Discussion on Spring Spring Creek Trail? No. Nope. You're the guy with the boots on the ground, so let us know if we're messing up here. Uh, Dean's Trail, Phase 2 and 3A. Oh, yeah. He's got a bunch of stuff for us. Jeff, you're up. I'm up? Okay. I didn't know if somebody else was going to talk or is it my turn? <laughs> so, uh, Dean's Trail Phase 2, we are, Chris, we are, the city's working on the final acquisition piece from Dewey Johnson, and then once that's complete, um, RDOT would release it for bidding. So, getting that, pretty close. That's two, which includes the trail, I mean, the tunnel. And Correct. Up, and up to um, Sarah Ford Avenue. Say that again. It, it starts at, is it Oriel Street? And goes back behind the Ford. businesses across Thrush. Right. And then right. turns south on the west side of the, the fire department, north side of 412. It goes underneath 412 and then goes back to the east to it goes to Sarah Ford, or the, the, the road that goes to the schools. And then stops. Right. right. 
I thought you I misunderstood. I thought you said Ford Avenue, which is a few miles away. But that's good. <clears throat> and then uh, 3A. 3A. I mean, we're, we're currently uh, in final design. Obviously, we've got the new, the new route from there at 412 down to uh, just north of Electric that we have uh, penciled in. We got that going. And then, obviously, the, the stuff that we are going to talk about today about the, the two existing tunnel crossings that were from 60% design that Garver has identified um, some substantial cost savings, um, you know, to get us, you know, further down the road in terms of trail building, you know, length of trail. But uh, also there's a couple of issues, uh, you know, doing final design on, on section 3A, we have to go back and check those tunnels. So I don't know if it's it, at this time you want me to go through that stuff, Chris, or if you've got other stuff. I, no, let, let's um, let's uh, stay on this one you know, and get it done. We did, some, we did some traffic counts as well uh, to give us some comfort or discomfort um, about leaving those on the surface. So yeah, let's go through it now. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead. I've got these. I know this stuff was sent out, I think, in, in the packet of information, but I've got it pulled up. Uh, I don't know if I can, can I request to share my screen? Uh, is that appropriate? I don't know who's, who's running the, who's Megan, running the show. I think, I think Megan. Megan's doing it. Is running everything. Uh, IT is actually running it. I'm not sure if they can let Jeff screen share, but Jeff, I have all of your documents preloaded okay so if you can flip to I, I think I sent three PDF files Megan the um, it's not Megan. Who is it? Who's running? Or, or, or we can just talk through them it, it doesn't really matter I mean it's huh? we got there should be two cost testaments Sorry, and it's, two it's, plan it's, sheets it's not Megan it's um, maybe I misunderstood so at Electric Avenue, uh, Megan, can you pull that one up for me, please? Is that, that the one that, that says speed, by the way? DP, DTP3, Electric Avenue speed, or do you remember what, you, what the title of it was? Yeah, I've got three files that are all start with Dean's Trail, and they're phase 3A, and then there's Electric Avenue crossing, uh, Spring, Creek cross, Spring Creek Avenue crossing, and then tunnel savings is two different cost estimates. So she's... I think she's got them pulled up there if they'll finish drawing the stuff. We're going to give it there a There we go. There we go. There we go. So what we see there on the screen is the, well, it's in black is what was done with our 60% design uh, sometime back. And what we're proposing here is to uh, go with a, a surface crossing on Electric Avenue with a standard, uh, it's a, it's a, what you see there is a standard City of Springdale mid-block crossing. Um, since we have three lanes on Electric Avenue that fits really good in the middle, those things are obviously known to slow down traffic as people approach them. Uh, we will have what's called the uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. You may have seen them around town some already at some crosswalks near schools and stuff. Kind of like a normal um, uh, crosswalk signal, pedestrian signal at a, a stoplight, except that they, they kind of flash rapidly. So it gets people's attention. They are very well studied and, and known to uh, decrease crash rates and that kind of stuff. So it gets people's attention. What the, the things to call out really other than, you know, the, the cost savings from not having to deal with, there is a eight inch uh, sanitary sewer line on the left side of the street there on the north side and there's a 12 inch water line on the south side of the road that would have to be relocated. So we'd have savings from not having to relocate those. And then what's, what's kind of hard to see down at the bottom of the sheet is called the profile. You can kind of see this thing goes down vertically, kind of goes down into the creek and then comes back out. 
And so right there in the middle is where it says box cover. That's, that's where it, it goes through the existing drainage box that's in the creek. And what we what had originally planned was is to take the trail through there and it is obviously a 12 foot wide concrete trail. These boxes on Electric Avenue and on the next one on Spring Creek are both eight foot by eight foot cells. So there's like four or five cells of these boxes next to each other. Well, in review of all of the uh, appropriate design standards for a trail, ADA, ASHTO, there, there's all these different ones. The minimum clearance you need in, in a, is, is eight feet. So we're right at that point. So you can, we, cannot, we cannot put lights in there. We don't have enough vertical clearance. Um, you, you can't hang anything down. You can't obstruct, you can't come from the sides. You know, you're, you're just going through a tunnel and coming back out. Um, so there, there's some there's some downsides there, but I, I think the main thing is when you're going down through um, the tunnel like this. If if any of y'all have been on the Greenway, kind of over by Washington Regional, when it goes under Fulbright uh, bypass, kind of similar to that, where you you go underneath, it's an existing box. I kind of use that as an example. Uh, some of you have been through that. Um, that box is um, well. This this existing structure at at one percent is 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 fairly flat. So I, I have some I have some concerns about when you're going down in through this thing and coming back out. I mean, we we had planned to build a barrier wall between the trail and the creek to keep some of the the lower flow you know out out of the actual tunnel that the trail goes through. Um, however. You know, stuff's gonna get trapped in there. Uh, obviously, I think it's parks and recs to keep, you know, keep that thing cleaned out. And it, it would be um, interesting to to try to drain that, try to you know, drain that tunnel on the downstream end, and just to try to keep you know, trash and debris out of there. So this one, I mean, it would it would theoretically work, but. Um, on when we get to Spring Creek, it absolutely won't work just because due to the that box is laid it is it's completely flat. It won't dirt, the water won't drain. This one it will at least drain to one end, but then you have the issue of just getting the water out of that trough. Uh, obviously, the if if this were to remain, you know, a tunnel crossing, you put up a sign that would say, you know, trail closed when underwater or whatever. But I just want to bring those up. And you know, like I said, we we've run for this particular crossing at Electric, going with the surface crossing with the mid block. There, it's a potential savings of uh, four hundred thousand dollars. So I, I thought it was definitely worth it to bring it to the, the city's attention, and and to this to this committee for discussion. What? So Megan, can you flip to the uh, Spring Creek one for me real quick? On this one, um, the projected you know cost savings is five hundred twenty thousand dollars. So between the two, you're almost a million dollars. That's quite a bit of quite a bit of money. And if we look at, uh, I know this one's a we'll call it the loop de loop. This one is uh, very similar to what is down there in Fable by Washington Regional. As you come up, approach from the south, you come over and go back under, type of situation. We have a, um, again, in review of this, we have an eight by eight box. It's at 0%. Uh, I am pretty much going to come out and say that it will not drain. Any, any, any water that gets in there, you're going to have a hard time getting it out of there. Um, the other thing with, with both of these box culverts, a trail or, or a sidewalk generally has, you know, slope, say from the, the back of the curb to the back of the sidewalk or on, on these trails, it's either they have cross slopes. So they have, you know, it's it's higher on one side than the other. So water drains off of, of the trail naturally. Well, in, in these tunnels, since we're using existing structures, not only in the case of Spring Creek, is it flat from end to end, it's flat from side to side. So even even on the one percent, you know, it's 
water gets in there, it's, it's going to move slowly from one end to the other. So on this one, we have um, the two blue lines that go through the middle of the page, left to right. They are spraying the water's uh, force mains that feed the, the south end of town. Uh, they are two 12-inch force mains uh, and dealing with uh, spraying the water on another project of mine currently on a 24-inch force main. They absolutely will not let me move the 24 at, at all. But uh, on, this, on this 12, uh, I haven't had any discussions with them yet, but we would have to relocate it since coming, coming around the loop-de-loop, -loop, going back under the tunnel, we have some retaining walls since we're cutting cutting down so they would have to be relocated if spring of water would even let me relocate them uh, we have a, the green line is a uh, sanitary sewer line that running running below that and then we have another water line running on the south side up and down there's obviously some other underground electrics and and telephone lines and stuff in here as well so we we, we believe that you know, the best thing to do design-wise would be to, as it's hashed in red, just come up, come up over the culvert, again, have a, a signalized crossing with these uh, rectangular flashing beacons, and then just go back down in the creek. So we would still have to extend the culverts out, but not go through them. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, Chris. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but... We would, we would like to uh, get y'all's input and be able to move forward and continue with, with design. Do you, do you know the headroom of the, uh, the big tunnel down by the hospital? No, sir, I don't. They, the size of the box, that, like on phase two that we're installing, is um, 12 feet wide and 10 feet tall. So we're able to put lights in the top of it and you know do that kind of stuff. And we're able to... We come back, we use a precast concrete box that sets it in place, so it it's speeds up construction. But we come back and we pour a, a sloping slab so the water drains off to one side and then drains out. So it's not, you know, pulling across the, hmm. across it. So that, we, we have headroom in, in that situation. Well, the one in, down by the hospital is, I'm not sure what it is, but it's tight. It feels like... <laughs> A little bit uncomfortable when you're going through it. I understand. And if we you, know, and you couldn't put, you, you you've got to have lights in there because you're going to be over a hundred feet under. I think the whole thing from start down roughly. Right. And you know, at five thirty at night in the winter time when people are riding their bikes, it'll be damn dark. And that's, in there. that was the biggest concern of mine, other than you know some of these utilities, you know here was one that this box at Spring Creek is is perfectly flat both end to end and left to right you know if you're going through it let alone the, the fact that you can't put lights in either one of these because you know I as an engineer can't do that I, I'm not allowed to uh, design code you know so mm -hmm. you're left with I mean you can put lights at either end but you're gonna still have a, a dark hole underneath the road and it, it's a safety security thing you know, to, to me personally. Dean, what are your thoughts? Chris, we can't hear him. Move him closer to the mic. You got, is your light on? That one's hot. <laughs> that one's better. Okay. Yeah, I see. That you, well, you have uh, money savings, which is important, and you have drainage issues and lighting issues. So I get all that. I think the other side of the chart would be the safety issues with the net grade crossing as opposed to a tunnel, which would obviously be safer uh, avoiding bikes versus uh, vehicles. So right. I, I think any comments related to the adequacy of the safety of the crossing uh you know would need to offset those other obviously good uh things so we did it we did traffic counts and can you address those as well or who, who would i had a hard time uh ciphering 
I can I can speak to them. Okay. Um, you've got two sets, one for Electric uh, Avenue and one for Spring Creek um, Avenue. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what each, are you looking at first? Uh, Electric Avenue um, says weekly vehicle counts. Yep. That's that's the got it. The counts they did uh, looks like one, two, three, four, five days of counts. Um, fairly well distributed through the day. Um, the average the average traffic would twenty four hour traffic would be a thousand cars a day, which is right at the bottom at end of our. Uh, High volume local street, and if you look at the speed statistics for Electric Avenue, you'll see about 28, 29 percent of folks exceed the posted speed limit of 35 miles an hour. Wasn't there one on one of these? There was one at 80 something. Uh, yeah, on. Uh, yeah, there's one at 80, one at 75, four at 70. But yeah, there aren't many, but there's some some folks moving way too fast. Yep. So is, is there a standard for uh, safety based on speed and traffic counts uh, for our grade crossing? I don't know. Uh, as far as the blinky lights and raised and this and that, all the options to make it more safe? I do not know that there's a standard for bicycles yet. That's part of that MUTCD, I think, that we're waiting for. Uh, we just, we post our speed limits based on our master street plan. Yeah, I'm, I'm not suggesting the posted speed limits are the issue. I'm just curious if, if the speed limit's 30 or 40 or 20 or whatever, and it's a two lane or it's a three lane, situation is there a standard uh, for bike crossings I don't think there's a standard yet okay it's pending Axton can you speak to that are we still, um, aren't we still waiting on MUTCD yeah I think we're waiting on the newest NACTO guide to come out um, I haven't had time to dive into this issue as much as I'd like to um, I do know that Fayetteville is working on some crossing standards um, based upon kind of a matrix of, of when you go from one type to another. Uh, the preliminary, it's, it's, it's still in draft form. Um, and from what I wasn't very good, to be honest. Uh, so I think there's gonna, it'll, be, it'll get better after there's feedback. Um, places like Seattle and Portland have some guidance. Um, I know that, uh, you know, it's very context sensitive. So example with the Spring Creek section where there's a curve coming from people headed east from when they're traveling from the west headed east, is that correct? There's a little bit of a curve before the, so you have to take into consideration sight lines for sure, especially when the rapid flashing beacons you're talking about. I think those are gonna be great and critical here because of the amount of use it'll get. You just wanna make sure that people are getting warned in plenty of time that somebody's at the crossing or is crossing. So, um, uh, but yeah, I can dive into it, but I don't think I'm gonna have any good hard data today on on what is gonna be used. I would, I would probably most look to what we've seen in other parts of the region and the context of these streets and volumes and speeds. Clearly there's some concerning speeds coming out of this um, and that, gets into how fast or how quickly somebody can slow down when they do see somebody in the crosswalk. Um, but really comparing it to other contexts in the region and what kind of crossing standards are there. So. Well, if you look at the, I'm looking at um, Electric Avenue, weekly vehicle counts, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, of course, in the seven to eight o'clock hour and then the five to six time frame. There's a lot of traffic, but on Saturday and Sunday, there's very little traffic all day long. I mean, there's times when there's no cars, which would be, I think, the time when there'd be most, uh, most bike traffic. But 
or certainly recreational but then if you look at Thursday Friday Saturday I mean Wednesday Thursday Friday there's some pretty high counts during the day then it drops off significantly and high counts are like two cars per hour yeah um, I would say something I mean, we're two, seeing two cars per minute I'm sorry what we're seeing in other parts of the region discussions with traffic and vehicle counts right now is that we do have less traffic on the roads because of COVID and so getting volumes and counts during this time period we have to keep in mind that it's not a normal situation and that we're also out of school so um, I think taking those two constraints about the busy times in the mornings and the evenings when people are recreating or going to work or school on bikes and walking is critical um, but from from my comparison of the volumes and other areas I think the rapid flashing beacons that have been proposed are, are great um, what Jeff was saying earlier I think bike and WA's opinion is that you know the, the the work that's been done it looks great our recommendation would be to make sure you've got some flashing yellow lights far enough back from the crossings to make sure if some if that one corner people can know ahead of time and then I may have missed this but didn't hear whether these crossings would be raised. Another pro, uh, best practice we're seeing is that you keep the sidewalk or the trail at that level and it creates a big speed table, kind of like what we see at North Street and the Razorback Greenway in Fayetteville, which is another speed mitigation device that keeps people from going too fast and, and it's safer for people crossing the road. And I think we're gonna see more and more of those used around the region. I was actually going to ask if we'd looked at uh, having speed bumps before and after the, the crossing to, to help with that and maybe the speed tables the, the better option than the speed bump. Yeah, I would, I would definitely recommend the speed table there, Bart. Uh, actually on our Park Street Intersections project where we're, done, we're redoing Park and Cottle, which is obviously sits directly on the Greenway, uh, we're doing more or less a, a modified roundabout. It's actually coined a, we're, we're calling it the square about. <laughs> for lack of a better term, <laughs> yeah, we're about. We, that's 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 a Jeff Webb, right? We'll coin that later. But anyway, we we have obviously we're having to essentially relocate the greenway. Is it? It's it's more or less than on the same trajectory, but it's we're having to slide it over, and it's going through this little we'll call it a tiny park that we're creating with um, you know a bike repair stand and a water fountain and all you know some of those amenities but you know um, obviously we know uh, roundabouts typically are one-way traffic going in, in a particular direction right counterclockwise so as the greenway crosses across each leg of that it's obviously just one one lane wide but we're, we're actually we're actually putting in uh, brick red colored you know speed tables you go up and up and then come back down so in addition to our RFB so I can very much see in addition to RFBs and and, and even in addition to the mid mid block crossing here that we would put in speed tables that's that's really not that much money to do that and in combination of all that stuff especially on electric people come up on this mid block crossing they, they get the feeling that they're kind of being squeezed you know they're, they're kind of being squeezed in right as they get to that get to that point and then go back out so I think that all of those things that the speed table the RFBs that the flashing beacons surely you won't see any of these these guys going 60 to 80 miles an hour through there or they're gonna tear up their vehicle you know and, and, and Dean may know this as well but this as close as these two roads are I was kind of looking at Fayetteville mm -hmm. looks like maybe Poplar and Sycamore where we mm -hmm. have you know and Paxton would be aware of that too those are I wonder how the traffic counts and speeds compare to those because this feels a little bit like that right because we go bang bang across those two roads they're kind of residential mm -hmm. um, it would be that's probably the closest comparison I can think of if we want to look at something where we're already doing something similar right yeah, both of those have rapid flash beacons and um, they don't have the raised crossings like Jeff was just talking about, but had they, had, if they were to be done over again, we'd be pushing strongly for it. Um, so yeah, Keith, I think you're right on there. 
Uh, one more note I was going to say is that has it been talked about doing trail lighting or street lights on this section to make sure these crossings are lit up at night? Very well, I mean, yeah, with all of Dean's trail, it's going to be lighted when it's when it's installed. Awesome. And so there's there's no there's no doubt that in addition to the RFPs, there will be trail lights all the way up and down through that. But with with these tunnels, I can't I cannot install lights in the tunnels. That there was a big. Oh my gosh! I've got to you know I've got to report that kind of a thing because. We, uh, I would think everybody that's we're putting these uh, new trails in it kind of expects if you light the trail, you need to light the tunnel. So, Jeff, was it, on can, the dark spot. was it considered to do anything like recessed lighting to still address the clearance issues but still get the tunnels lit or the boxes such they can't be modified to, to handle recessed lighting? There, are, I think one, one set's a cast in place box, the other one's a precast box. I mean, I. I'm not saying that you can't do that, Bart. I just, I mean, you can't have anything hanging, obviously, in right. that eight-foot envelope. So, I, w I wish they were ten foot tall, then we wouldn't have this discussion. Other than the, other than the floor. Well, as we, we <clears throat> as we go forward, we, as a city, mm -hmm. and, and have these opportunities to build in the future, we can put ten foot culverts and. Sure, we have that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have that opportunity to, to kind of do those things. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it makes. <clears throat> go ahead. So if we save a million here, can we go another mile south? What? Hey, do we know the clearance of the underpass there? What's it right at Bluff Cemetery? Um, I was trying to think of our short tunnels that we've got, you know, on the Greenway. And that's obviously not a tunnel. It's, it's a road, right? But I was just wondering how tall that one is compared to the size of these culverts. I have no clue. My sense of it as I think about riding through there that it's probably closer to 10 feet than eight. Yeah, I think so too. I'll take a tape measure tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> report just back. just there a little bit ago. Be, be, be sure and report back to the committee. <laughs> uh, again, for reference, if, if you're riding over there by Washington Regional and you go through that really, really super long tunnel that goes under Fulbright, yeah. those are 10, that's, that's a 10 foot high box. Okay. Just feels, for reference. <laughs> it feels tight. When well, I, I was about to say, for what it's worth, my wife and daughter went through it with me about two weeks ago, and they don't want to go back through it. <laughs> I mean, it, and it has lights in it. I mean, Fayetteville's fixing to come in and pour a new floor in that long box and, and, and redo some drainage just to make it try to work a little bit better. I mean, it, it's just drainage, drainage around these things is just... It's crazy when you're dealing with an existing structure like this, and you you can't do it like like on Don Tyson when we're going underneath it. It was planned, so we had there's a one cell over there that's that's a foot or two higher than the rest of it, you know, and it's it's already got lights in it, and we just connect up to it and go. But that was planned to be like that. Right. I, I see your point, Chris. Well, I I have a thought that we built we we go forward with this modification we can always if we if we determine that in the future there's too much traffic or too much danger we can always come back and go under this won't spend a lot of money uh, to, to get us moving forward and this mid block crossing design uh -huh. is what's used a couple of places on our 40th street project where the where the that trail crosses 40th street and this is the same detail that's being used on Ford Avenue where it crosses Dean's Trail Phase 1. We're also proposing it on Dixieland up on the north end of town on a, on a couple of spots because we got the trail running up one side of the road to cross back over. Uh, so. Dean, you're the bike guy. Thoughts about... No, I think, I mean, I'd kind of want to defer to, to Paxton or whoever as far as the safety at crossing. If he feels like it is reasonable, then I'm fine. If you look at, a, I, I, I kind of shifting gears here, I went back and looked at the traffic counts on Spring Street, 
Spring, no, Spring Creek yeah. Avenue. <clears throat> there's there's about it's uh, half more than less than half the traffic is electric, which I was kind of surprised by that. So that one would be less. Uh, yeah. Looking at the Google Maps, the sight lines on Spring Creek are way, way, way better too. I mean, there's for now, right? The, the electric avenue is kind of surrounded by on all four corners. But Spring Creek's not, right? It's kind of big, wide open areas, kind of like down by Don Tyson. Yeah, you kind of come down, you kind of come down from 265, you know, down down the hill into that thing. So I don't think I have a problem seeing those RFBs if somebody activates them, you know, there. Well, so Paxton, I guess we'll kind of defer to you. If we do the right things in designing this, uh, at grade crossing and putting a speed table there and whatever, um, you would be comfortable with that as a rider and as a designer? Yeah, thinking about all ages and abilities, I mean, I just get that the, it's mitigating the huge cost savings and safety. Um, but even given the speeds, just from the little bit I've looked out there, I mean, the speeds are a concern, but the, the volumes, I don't know that they qualify for a tunnel. Um, given the volumes of vehicles that we're seeing, um, you know, someday if it gets, if the development changes and you've got a ton more traffic, I mean, it's, you know, 10 years from now, you could put in a tunnel still. I mean, I think it's, that's an option, but for right now, I agree with Jeff, what he was saying, and let's just do everything we can to make it safe. Um, yeah. Thank you. What? Hey, Chris, the one other thing I see on Spring Creek is basically we have a road shift there, right? It shifts a little bit. So there's actually two curves surrounding that. From a safety perspective, some of those blinky lights, they might need to actually be moved further back into the to the traffic lot. You know what I mean? Uh, moved, people away are be, the, moved away from uh, away from the crossing. Exactly. And, and yeah, just because, yeah, there's curves both sides coming into that yep. just to give the cars more warning. Keith, there some crossings in the area do put an additional yellow signal down the road, like additional light that is kind of like a pre-warning light also, which if you pull them too far from the crossing, you're unprotecting yeah. the crossing. So I think it, it's the idea would be to put another one with yeah. any sort of speed or sight line issues. I was going to say add, add additional kind of pre-warning and at the point we reduce the speed coming into the crossing. You and the speed that. limit on spring is 25. Right. And, I've, and I'm pretty conscious of speed limits around town. And I'll tell you, 25 is hard to maintain. So I would, you know, probably 30, 35 is going to be the norm. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Je Jeff, on the Spring Creek one with the, the proposed what's mm -hmm. in red, um, we've got that parallel section along the roadway there, making that 90 if you're headed toward the, the south to cross the, the street. The, the cyclist is almost having to look over their left shoulder to see that. Is, is there any reason we couldn't straighten that out to connect up toward the top left of the, the image, or is it kind of a, a property and right-of-way issue at that point? Um. Since the city pretty much owns the Clear Creek tributary, I don't know that it's a property issue. Um, yeah, if you could come, instead of making that, come, going south and making the 90 degree turn, I guess I'm going north. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta get north up on my map. Okay, <laughs> so if I'm going north, I cross and take an immediate right. Yep, and then curve degree. back around. But if, if the city of Springdale owns all that, which I, Kind of think they. I think water and sewer owns it. City, the city owns all the property surrounding this crossing. No, I'd almost take a forty-five degree angle up, up to that, and that that would help improve the the visibility of the cyclist. Any un, oncoming traffic that would improve the safety. It would require you probably extending the box culvert a little bit further to to get across. But you could almost put a little grass area or a little garden feature there over the, the extension that's uh, not being used between the road and the, the path. I'm 
still hard for me to, to visualize what you're talking about, but somebody had to draw, <laughs> sketch it up. Or Megan can bring up like Google yeah. Maps, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not, it's just a... Uh, I'm reasonably certain you can get that easement from the Water and Sewer Department. And then make it, make it fit with respect to the box culverts and straighten it out. It would, would really be... I, I think that would help with the, the cyclist's visibility and, and maybe even the, the, v, the, the driver's visibility of the cyclist as well. Yep. So, we don't exactly have a quorum. Do we have to have one to move forward? I don't, th I don't think there are any real... We're advisory, not official, so... No, so... Well, let's, um, let's stay above ground. Okay. And straighten out that uh, part going north. And Jeff, I can sketch it up for you tomorrow and send it to you. Yeah, since you know what you're talking about. We're still coming from the south and turning, we're going across the road and turning right, but then as you go across the box culvert, instead of this nine degree swoop, you're talking about doing something different? This is what, this is what, yeah, exactly. Is that correct, Bart? Like this, dude, get some. Yeah, we can figure that out. I mean, today was just to, you know, go from the, the tunnel to the surface. We can work out the surface path. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay, does that uh, give you the okay to go ahead and uh, finish design? If Brad says it's okay, we'll, we'll move forward. <laughs> He's the man. Jeff, the you man. know where I live, so. <laughs> Excellent. That's... Uh, I mean, I, I, I was really hoping we'd have the, the uh, tunnels, but a million dollars and relocations and... A million drainage. dollars is a million dollars, right? Yeah, and the, <laughs> and the, the drainage is the part that would be particularly tough in that area. Well, it's, it's the lighting. It's, it's, the, it's really the lack of drainage that you have down in this because you, you create this, like, trough for this hole in the ground. Again, if you've been in... On the Razorback Greenway at Fulbright, is is that exact situation, and right. if you've ever been through there or you look on Street View, there's there's ton of debris and you know, mud and it's always wet and it just you know right not really favorable for a trail crossing in my in my mind. And then and then you then you get it, then you take off. I ain't got no lights in it, and you're like, well, it's not really that great. Well, we we and it leaves us. It's a pretty pretty cheap and simple solution, and it leaves us the opportunity, if we de determine that we need to, is to come back later and put a tunnel. Yeah, sure. Under one or both. Exactly. Hey Jeff, before we move on, uh, let me text this to you, and you can look at it and see whether you see any uh, issues that we need to address. Okay. Before we. How far does how far does this section go? Because once you get past those two, the, the Don Tyson tunnel's already there. We're going. We're going. The three A goes under Don Tyson and stops. We're we're going to come back up the side of that the embankment up the side of the creek because the new animal shelter is right there. We're going to take a ten foot sidewalk up to the existing sidewalk, and we're call, that's, we're calling it done for three A. So you haven't gone past Don Tyson. You have. I thought we were t or in my we're mind. We're going under Don Tyson and stopping right at the, as so you come up the on. ramp, right? That's where we'll stop. I and thought, then we're going to build a 10 foot uh, sidewalk or trail back up to the sidewalk on Don Tyson. And that's, that's where we're stopping. I don't know that it matters one way or the other, but I thought that we were going to go to the south side of the animal shelter property. So it'd be another. That'll be phase 3B. I'm going from basically Don Tyson to Lake Fayetteville Trail somehow. That's still yet to be probably, I don't know that we ever determined, uh, the committee ever determined that final route at this point. We, we did some, I know we did a bunch of different routes and gave different cost estimates for these different, different okay. ones, Chris. But again, that's, 
just trying to get get from here to here and we can worry about from there to there, you know, right. yeah. at some point. Pardon me. Oh. The text is going slow, so just we can, we can proceed. Yeah, go ahead. We'll come okay. back to that. Next item, there's some some pictures that I somebody's going to bring up. Uh, they're in your packet. They're of Maple and Holcomb. They're preliminary. Uh, well, they're, uh, they're where we're at right now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, on Maple. In front of the hospital, the uh, the uh, zebras and the stanchions are there and staying there. The hospital is very comfortable. Uh, yeah, oh, did we? They're there. Um, so in the hospital area, gosh, there's a bunch of pictures. In the hospital area, that we will leave it as it was. There, they like that. It calms the traffic. Their people feel safer. Uh, so we'll leave that as, as it has been installed. But then moving to the east, uh, all of the uh, zebras have been taken up. And um, reflectors have been put down. Uh, striping has not taken place yet, but will shortly. But I've, I've driven over it a couple of times and intentionally driven over the... Uh, uh, reflectors and it will while it's not as violent and, and uh, automobile damaging <laughs> as a zebra uh, it will get your attention uh, you, you know you're moving out of the lane like rumble strips on the interstate so um, I think it I think this is as we keep going it'll be a good thing I mean it's not going to be as quite as safe as zebras but uh, public opinion has kind of taken over. Uh, there are zebras in front of the, is it Lisa School? Lisa Academy, we left the zebras there because of children in that air proximity. But as you look through those, do you see anything that we need to continue to address or just Keep moving forward and hope that uh, the, the council members, the mayor, and the community uh, approve. Is the intent, Brad, to leave the uh, little holes where the zebras were open, or are they going to be filled? They're, They're filled. Okay. Okay. Took them a couple of tries to get the right. <laughs> Any other comments on Maple and Holcomb? Uh, Chris, I've got just a question. Um, Brad, on, the, on Holcomb, when there's, where there's the parking spaces, I was under the impression that planters or something was going to be utilized to keep people from just driving down the parking spaces down the road, which is something that we had a problem with when we first installed before we had the zebras up. Um, for the parking side of that street it's still being evaluated kind of by others we have concrete pots yeah, i think they're working to see if lisa academy will keep them watered if we plant them we've got uh, if you've driven down um, emma the big uh, concrete pots that have flowers in them that's what they're looking at but okay it hadn't been finalized yet okay yeah that was just one of our biggest safety concerns are there also reflectors in the buffer area where the between the parking and the bike lane or did you all put reflectors down there as well i can see reflectors leading up to it but i can't tell if there's reflectors in them Okay. Yeah, that, that would just be, if there's not, that would just be our recommendation would be to, um, you know, put that in, especially for people parking at night or, or whatever, and just, just that extra degree of safety. Um, and 
then just to keep monitoring this. So I can talk to this, talk to it now or a little bit later about the data counters we bought, but we'd like to utilize them on, on somewhere on this route to be able to capture how it's being used. So. Okay. Um, next item is project schedules and cost estimates. You will, if you were here, we have packets that have the Gantt chart, the infamous Gantt chart, that has 21 projects on it, and their current status, uh, where they, where um, they would go. This would go through January of 22. That's the longest one. Um, but it gives you a good idea of what's like. Um, That's some street projects in there as well, but they would have side paths. All the bomb streets have side paths. And if you, I don't, yeah, you can see, well, the pictures of everybody is uh, obstructing the view of the uh, dollars. Uh, the far right of the Gantt chart has uh, the dollars associated, uh, the uh, project cost estimates associated with each of these projects. It's a it's a good good tool to have to look at just to see where we're at. Total dollars are not on there. Next time just put a sum all. Is there a sheet in here that gives construction and my understanding is that they added uh, uh, engineering and land acquisition costs to the ones on the chart. You okay, know, I've got, uh, is that this one? It's not the whole list. It's uh, Spring Creek Trail, Deans 2, and Deans 3. And those are the ones we're working on right at the moment. <clears throat> the top one was Gene George. That was that big one. I noticed that on the left. Say again. I say that yeah, that line five, that fourteen million was Gene George. What's line sixteen? That's a big one. Oh, that's the harbor extension, right? Those are the big street projects, right? Right, but they have side pass on them. Yeah. Yeah. Harbor actually extends the Oh yeah, is that the yeah. Uh, that's the one that we've been it's what we've called the uh, initially called the Pride of Springdale Trail, which is now an extension of Emma, a, a, a connection of Emma and Harbor with a um, side path on it, a separate. There's a traffic bridge, and then there will be a vehicle. Yes. Yeah. See, this says Watkins to 64th. Oh, 264th. Is the one you're speaking about, Brad, the Watkins to 48th? Yeah. That's part of, that's 2 million. <clears throat> Widening. Uh, that's the, the street. Yep, yeah. and then adding the side path. Any others that you want to discuss? Now back again and tell me how we lost a million dollars which means
because there's no revenue sharing from the state or Fed or both fuel tax. Mm -hmm. So we're not necessarily losing it. It's just if we have a surplus, that money has been allocated up to nine hundred thousand. Okay. Brad, we can't hear you. It goes away here in a few years if it doesn't pass. Yeah, it's on the ballot. That's that's what the funding trails. They got a number that said that may be impacted as much as nine hundred thousand dollars in two thousand twenty and maybe the first part of two thousand twenty one. So that's been identified as a potential cut if necessary. So I guess if you circle that all the way back, if we tried to build the tunnels, we might not have the money. Well, currently the, the current projects can proceed as planned. Okay. That was the other thing is what we don't want to stop any of our projects okay okay I like the Gantt chart we keep yeah I do too keep uh, improving it so Sum the total so we can see how many dollars we're looking at and know some of that street. And, I, and if possible, and I don't know how difficult it would be, add a second column that shows how much has been spent. So, Brad, on this, I understand the uh, modification of Gene George down to Willow Creek is, is, uh, will include the side path. Is that all beginning? Uh, Willow Creek down to Johnson. It's angling off. Okay. That's part of the it's, bond. Is that? It's, it's three feet. <laughs> okay. I guess my question: all that's going to include uh, bike uh, side path, right? Yeah. And we don't have to pay for that. That's the bonds pay for that, right? That is, yes, that's okay. Correct. Well, phase one is a bond project. We'll right. see what phase two and three are. ST EBGA. Or the next section. Moving ahead with phase one. Yep. Okay. That would get us, gosh, that gets us a whole, by the time Gene George is done to Elm Springs Road and beyond. And then on the south side, it'll go all the way to Main Street or whatever it is when that's done. Right. But, mm -hmm. and that, so that will give us a north south. Western Loop. Almost. Almost. You have to cut through Johnson. Yeah. Almost. But if Johnson can get their act together, they they have a plan to connect. Yeah, Ball Street to uh, Ball Street today. over right. to yeah. correct. Which is not that big a deal, and they, they it goes through mostly water and sewer property, and and we'll give them the easement for that. So. Correct. Yeah. And then we'll connect on the north end um, at roughly a wagon wheel, right? Back to Eventually it'll go Lake to Springdale wheel, yeah. and Game and Fish and whatever. So, yeah. I mean, I think we have to keep our eye on the target is to have a master loop with east west connections at, uh, at Watkins and, uh, and Harbor. Right. I mean, if we can eventually get a master loop with some intermediate east west connections, then we have something, in my yeah. opinion. 
Well, we need and we need to get uh, our friends back in here. To, we need to get our friends back in here to uh, uh, fairly soon to assist us with the master plan update. What? Who was that? Tool group. Tool group. <laughs> Tool group. We need to we need to start having a conversation with them. Yeah, I just think it's important that in some fashion that we make the community aware of what we're trying to accomplish over time. It's a lot of money, a lot of planning, a lot of acquisition, but here's the goal. And then the pressure can come from that direction. Correct. To pay for it. To this council. Correct. Yeah. So to, to that, it's a great question. Um, so to that end, our Spring Creek, it's just going to end right now, just past Game and Fish, right? We're not going under 49 yet. So we're but you know in the conversation we just had and all that you know we'll start getting pressure to to make that connection right once we get gene george up elm springs you know then there'll be the pressure to get up to wagon wheel and go ahead and connect under 49 right that's that'll be the gap in this loop that dean was talking about right yes that and the on the south end a uh, small section through johnson mm -hmm. but that'll be when that's done that'll be really uh, nice um, but also on the north end where it follows the creek under 49 where we're by game and fish eventually it'll move on to the west um, <clears throat> and there's uh, 120 acres or so that's owned by the water department that will have a, that has a great um, layout for additional off-road trails Paxton, are you aware of those? Say that again. The uh, property to the west of the interstate uh, all along Spring Street where I think a group got together, uh, uh, some of the Walton group, and have looked at that property and have a, have a uh, rough layout of off-road trails kind of like Fitzgerald Mountain. But that that's that's, that's that's possible. <laughs> that that's property that's owned by the Water and Sewer Commission. We've had those preliminary conversations. The neat thing about that is once when you can go to the creek or follow the creek uh, to the west a short distance and then go up through a draw to a nice piece of flat piece again owned by the Water and Sewer Department, and it's less than a mile to the new Shaw Park. So you connect that piece together you go from shaw park over to the greenway all the way out to the east to the willie george park I mean, it's just there there the potential and the opportunities are almost unlimited and yeah, i drove by the new shaw park and they've moved a lot of dirt looks like they've got some of the maybe it might have been a bathroom already built so they're, they're starting to move quicker on that park now yeah. And it'll be just kind of sitting there by itself until we get trails connected to it, right? Right. Um, Paxton, you wanted to tell us about a new counter. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, is it all right if I share my screen? If you know how. Okay. Paxton, <laughs> you should be able to share. Okay, give me just a second. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, do you have a 12 year old daughter? Uh, yes, your son. <laughs> you need help? <laughs> <laughs> She's not here right now, though. Oh, uh, yeah. So here. you're panicking. I, I just I just found it. OK, here we go. So um, we have been looking at some beta, better data counters. Um, what kind of technology is out there? Um, the eco counter technology that is used across the region is great but it only gives you counts of things and it um, can distinguish between a person walking and a person riding a bike but the use is pretty much limited to a trail or a sidewalk um, it's not going to be able to capture the entire street and sidewalk and trail at the same time so um, there's there's a company called numina and you're looking at this picture on of, of a of a computer that mounts to a pole and it has a video camera at the bottom of it and so 
what this allows um, what this allows to do is it uses it taps into a power supply and it allows you to um, let me get my mouse here if you can see that better now here's the camera and you mounts about 15 feet high up on a pole ideally some type of light pole that already has a power source that you can tie into and then it uh, records video it has an art artificial intelligence processor on the device that takes the video and it converts it into point and line data. So as you see here in this screenshot, you get this overview and each color represents either a bicycle, a person driving a car, a person walking. It can tell the difference between a bus and a delivery van and a car. And so it really breaks down by each type of user and not only tells you the number of things, but it can tell you which way they were going. Some of the analysis that we've seen tells if people were walking in the crosswalk or outside of the crosswalk. So it's a pretty incredible technology. There's an online dashboard. What's really great about it though, is that it uses artificial intelligence to process the video data on the computer and it's encrypted. And so what it sends to the cloud is simply the data that you see here is these lines and dots. So there's never a person's picture or license plate or anything else that's sent to the cloud. Um, the computer's encrypted. So if somebody was to steal the computer, they're still not gonna be able to get um, the data off of it in terms of the raw video. So um, it really preserves privacy, but it also lets you do some counting with behavior zones, heat maps, figuring out exactly where people are walking on the trail or the road. Um, we've even heard some cities have used it to count the number of trash bags left out on the sidewalk. So um, we purchased four of these counters. My intent was to have one that we could demo in each of the cities. We've also paid for the monthly cell phone data fee that it basically sends the data to the cloud. It's about $125 a month. And um, we're, we've, we've got the computer sitting in my house and um, we're looking at, would love to partner with the city of Springdale to install this somewhere, um, ideally either on Maple or Holcomb so that we could get some better data about who's using it in terms of how much it's being used and what are the modes. Um, and, you know, we're willing to cover the cost of it for the next year after that point. Cities don't want it, we'll take it and install it somewhere else. Um, it's pretty quick install. I'm actually getting ready to help the city of uh, Fayetteville's bike ped coordinator to install one on our slow streets route off Dixon Street this weekend. And then uh, the parks department in Bentonville is gonna install one as well downtown on A Street to, uh, to start testing it and seeing what it can do. So um, I would love, you know, just put that out there to the trail committee that um, we'd love to partner with the city and, and try to find a place somewhere on Maple or Holcomb to install this and uh, let the city demo it for, you know, the next year. Brad shaking his head yes, said it sounded good. So I would uh, pass that buck to Brad, who will pass it to somebody. All right. Well, you just let us know if and when you're ready and we'll, we'll, we'll work with you on the next step, so. Okay, I, I think we're ready, so. <laughs> um, okay, I'll follow up with Brad then. Um, okay. Yeah. That'd be Thank good. You. I, you know, the thing I thought about, and it would be a little bit expensive uh, for this, but, you know, we've done the, the head counts or the volunteers counting uh, people going by on the trails to get an, uh, an estimate of the usage of the trails. And you got to chase people down or stop them when they fly by or whatever. It'd be be a good indicator of, uh, give you a good idea of the counts uh, that are going by. You wouldn't know whether they're going to work or going to, for, to dinner or whatever, but it'd be a little expensive for that operation. Yeah, we, we are, just as a note, um, uh, trail, in North of Arkansas Trailblazers and ourselves have also been looking into other counting technologies. We're currently um, getting sample data from one of these companies that aggregates our cell phone data that takes your supposedly unique ID that is not matched with any of your sensitive information from your cell phone that every time you walk around town, it's pinging the towers. And so 
um, it, other companies purchase that data and analyze it and um, they're able to tell where your journey starts and stops within a census block group. Um, so we are looking at getting some demos of the data so that we would know like how many people went to Fitzgerald Mountain and Road Trails that are from Springdale, that are from Fayetteville, or that are from Iowa. And it'll tell us the number of people that went and used that trail system. So we may have some, some information for you all in the coming months once we find out a little bit more information about that. Are you buying that information from the Chinese? <laughs> you bought that uh, from we got, Huawei. <laughs> we got a couple of companies uh, that I, I believe they're U.S. based, but you know, you never know if you start digging. <laughs> hey Paxton, on your your Numina ones, um, are you going? Do you want to leave them in the same spot for a year? Or are you going to move them around? Like the one thing I was thinking about is down by like Gene George, where the Greenway runs today, and we've got the crosswalk where the kids go and you know you because it picks up cars and everything it would be fascinating to to watch that you know what's what are the cars doing uh, the bikes uh, bike um, guilty will jump off the trail get on the road to zip through that intersection i was that's why i was just thinking you know there's there's some interesting areas throughout that we might look at as well i just didn't know if you wanted to leave it in one spot for a year or i mean i'm open to that it costs us uh, six hundred dollars every time we want to move this thing so, um, but we've got a little bit of budget in there. Um, ideally, we'd have it in place in Maple or Holcomb for say the next yeah. six months. That way we could just get some idea of, of, of how it's being used. I mean, we'll be able to tell if cars are driving down the bike lanes, I believe. So that can help us really understand the behavior. But absolutely, it's up to you all. I think moving it around um, after that to some locations to help you all answer some questions you have uh, we're willing to partner with you on that and if, you know I, i'm pretty sure we can come up with the money to install it at least a couple of times over the next year um yeah so for sure thanks paxton thanks for that information <clears throat> and brad's waiting patiently <laughs> <laughs> i'm thinking the data would be better after maple maple oh, <laughs> oh well we could we could start with holcomb uh, what what Brad's saying is, uh, in a short period of time, Maple's going to be open straight through. So you would go down Maple and by the post office across the railroad tracks and hit the hit the Greenway. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be well, using Holcomb. It, it does. There's a there's a field of view, so it may be that we could get it like somewhere in the corner of Maple and Holcomb and be able to tell which way people are going and where they're coming from. Also, so we just have to kind of look at what poles, what light poles are in there in, in, in that area. Okay. And Paxton, one of the other things that the check will be interesting to know is, you know, obviously they're using AI. I wonder if, if they have tagged strollers too. Um, one of the interesting parts of watching all these trails is the number of people that walk them with strollers. Because, you know, we're used to cyclists and runners, but in some areas, especially down through the, through that part of Springdale and some of the other areas, we have a lot of you know moms and dads that walk kids to school, and that'd be a fascinating piece of data to see too. Yeah, um, uh, they're a great. They're a small company. I've, I've been talking with the owner. Um, she's really super sharp, and she's definitely open to recommendations. And I think they're open to testing new things out. So if they haven't tried to get yeah. the AI to train it on what a person pushing a stroller looks like, I'm happy to to pass that by them. So I do know they can differentiate between people on bikes, people walking and bags of trash. <laughs> so that's, yeah. What um, about dogs? People walking their dogs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, they just have to train those models. It's, it's, it's not that hard. It just takes a little bit of time. Thank you. Anything else? Any other business? I was going to bring up the Powell section there by the airport uh, the gravel we were talking about oh yeah um, um, probably for Brad uh, I did the square to square challenge over the weekend and that section of Powell there by the airport where you have the industries off to the the east of the the Greenway they've all got gravel lots and a lot of that gravel just gets kicked up on the sidewalk is that something that's the city's responsibility or the industry's responsibility or yes or no yes <laughs> I'll figure it out. In the, is it in the street? It's in. It's on the 
the concrete trail. It, it, it's on the, the greenway. We'll have to work with parks because the concrete. <laughs> I'm guessing what we'll do is we'll get one of the big blowers and blow it out in the street and have a street sweeper come And, and I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always noticed it along there, but I didn't know is that something that we should try to encourage those businesses to put some sort of barrier there to keep the gravel off or what what we could do because it, it i mean it'll be a continuous maintenance issue for for the parks department you just have to look at the lay of the land it's mostly chat it's real thin stuff like cinders it's not big gravels right because i was looking at it today as i rode by and um, that stuff is irritating on road bikes because the that little stuff gets in the tires and you get a flat but mountain bikes would could care less about it I've got yeah, a it's always there. I've got a road bike with somewhat aggressive tires, not completely pavement tires, and it, it handles it fine. But I'm looking at somebody that might be more uh, pavement only tires wouldn't wouldn't want to hit it. And, and I think uh, Keith, when I was out there Friday, I saw a few pieces about the size of the tip of my thumb. So there, there's not much of it, but every now and then there will be a, a larger piece out there. Yeah, it's kind of always there to the point, you know, I was going to take a blower over there and just blow it back into the gravels and stuff. I just didn't get to it yet. <laughs> Brad says he's got a blower that'll take care of it. <laughs> we just put it on. <laughs> Say again? We just put it on our machine today. Oh. Uh, Any time a ranger does that, it's just yeah. off the street. Yeah. Off yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Anything else? Hey, do those, we've got counters. There's a counter on a pole at Lake Springdale. And then there's a counter right at the top of the hill at Tyson, where as you drop down to Lake Fayetteville. Are those actually counting anything? Are those turned off? They're on the poles. Um, you, you probably know which ones I'm talking about. I know we didn't have many counters on. I'd love to see our traffic counts on those two, those two sections of the trail. Okay, if, uh, I'm sure you didn't hear Brad. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. We haven't heard a thing Brad said the whole time. He's going to have. <laughs> he's going to get Steve Hatfield. They've been monitoring that for some time, so he's going to try to get the data from Steve Hatfield. Okay. Yeah, that was all. I just thought I, as I passed that today, I was thinking about that again. Okay. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining. We got the good discussion. We got some good things happening. See you next month. Great job, Chris. <laughs> yeah. And Megan. <laughs> hey, I got a uh, text back from Jeff. He said that alignment may be feasible. He's going to sketch it up. He said he might actually recommend adding a separate box culvert rather than extending that one to that. So he, he said he'd look into it. Yeah.